Hi, my name is Patsy. Uh, my husband Kevin here. I'm not going to say much tonight because of the fact that some of the presentations that we do do, I have, I'm more involved. This one I'm not as involved with as uh, other than doing the, um, the legwork on putting the program together. <laughs> as you can see here, uh, this will tell us tell you a little bit about what we do. And as you can see, it's a good thing we're retired because there's no way we have time to do all this. But uh, I'd like to say that we do in this program, the one thing that uh, we did put in this program, we have a short video and hopefully we can show that to you. It might be disturbing to some people. When Kevin and I first saw the video, it's part of a, actually part of a movie, isn't it? And when I first saw the video, oh, I actually cried. But you know how they say uh, pictures with a thousand words in this video really tells more of the story than we could probably ever tell the story about um, Native Americans uh, going to the Toma Indian School. So again, as you can see, I won't go through all of what we do. This is the stuff that we do here, and I'm going to hand it over to, to Kevin. Already? Well, again, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to stand out here if it's okay, and as I get in your way or anything like that, just let me know. Uh, essentially, growing up in the Kickapoo Valley, we're about as down to earth as you can possibly get down there. Kickapoojans, if you've heard of us. Uh, I graduated Lafarge High School back in the day and then ended up uh, going to a little college that's closed called Milton College down by Jamesville. And then after I graduated from there, I was, was hired to teach history at Watoma, not Toma, but Watoma. Was there for four years and then came back near home to Cashton, and that's where I spent the rest of my career teaching was at Cashton. So kind of Monroe County, Vernon County, back to the roots as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I've got to be somewhat careful with this microphone because I coached basketball for 33 years, baseball for 20 years, and I am able to have a coach's voice which means if I get too stirred up or whatever about things, I don't want to drag you out by too much sound. Can uh, everybody hear okay? Because I know I, I really don't like that when I'm someplace and I can't hear, and at the same time, I don't want to blast you up. So, so just uh, feel free to, to let me know one way or the other. Uh, how this happened, or how this started for us, actually, is we've, we've done various programs. As you might have read up there, we're step-on guides for the Amish community in the Cashin area, which of course encompasses a large um, number of people, uh, around 2,000 to 2,500 Amish now live in the area, over 100 businesses. Vernon County, now one in every 10 people living in Vernon County is Amish. Okay. So why is that there? Because I get off on tangents and keep going. So uh, we've done programs on the Amish. We've done programs on the round barns because Patsy's an artist, she painted each of the round barns in Vernon County and then I did the historical research and working along with the Vernon County Historical Society, we published what we call our coffee table book. And then we were at an auction one time in Cashton and I happened to see a big old box full of letters and I saw a couple places that said U.S. Sanitary Commission on it. Uh, being a history teacher, I, I suspected, well, knew, that was a forerunner kind of the Red Cross from Civil War, gambled that they were Civil War letters, and it turned out to be that we bought, I think it's 182 Civil War letters sent back from a guy to his wife. And he, of course, <coughs> is uh, now buried at Town Clinton, Vernon County, right down by Cash. And so it's, uh, that was published by the University of Wisconsin Press. So that was a, that was a project. Uh, Cheyenne Valley, if you've heard of that, which was a, Tri-racial isolate between Hillsborough and Ontario, we do programs on that. Um, this one was a little different. I, I kind of got, we did several different programs at the Cross Libraries, and for some reason, I, I say, once you retire, you can be very, uh, you gotta be careful not to say yes all the time, because you think you have all the time in the world and so do other people. But they've always treated me really well up there. And so for their book clubs, they had read a book one time about the Lusitania, the sinking of Lusitania, and they asked me if I would present more background information to that book, so I did. Then they asked me if I would do some background information uh, for an Underground Railroad book that they 
hadn't read in their book club selection. So it all comes down to them contacting me about a book that they were reading called Between Earth and Sky by Amanda Skenador, which was about uh, Native American, Indian, indigenous, whatever the terminology is without trying to be offensive to anybody because it kind of changes. Um, boarding schools that in the book was set in La Crosse, but La Crosse did not have an Indian boarding school. And so when I started to do research, I assumed that the well best known boarding school in the area was, was Toma. And so I did my research on Toma, which was modeled after Carlisle, which all of the other boarding schools that were government run tended to, to follow. And so uh, that's what happened. I got a hold of the author, she was very, very nice. And she said, I asked, I asked her if they based it, the fictitious story on the Toma boarding school. And she said, not really. Uh, we based it on Carlisle School and then just kind of like had a setting in lacrosse for whatever reason. So, so that's how I got, I wouldn't say roped into this because I enjoy historical research, but it's gone farther than my intentions ever really were. My only intention was to present supplement material to a book reading club with more knowledge as far as boarding schools are concerned. And that was two and a half years ago. I did quite a bit of my research though, where would you go if you're looking for Monroe County, Monroe County Historical Society, Monroe County Museum is where we come, or the Vernon County one, which is a close by oil across. And so, kind of made a uh, deal with Jared, I guess you would say, that since they, he was so good, and the staff up here was so good about us accumulating some of the materials and research from this museum, that I would do a program for him here. So that's how I ended up here, basically, tonight. He said yes again. Yes, yes. I've learned that yes, yes, and yes. My wife's trained me, yes. <laughs> and we also, you know, we did one time, we like to joke around, you know, with each other. We, we uh, do a lot of team type things. Just about everything we do is as a team. And sometimes, <coughs> This is a very, very serious, difficult subject. And if something happens, her and I, especially me, have any kind of lighter moment, it has nothing to do with the seriousness of the subject. So it's, please don't take it as uh, I think this is a pleasant subject, because it's not. Uh, I don't know where you're at with this, and you can be anywhere you want to be with this, but I know there are a lot of folks that get kind of get tired of these things happened years ago. I wasn't born yet. My parents weren't even born yet. I had nothing to do with any of this. And so therefore, why should I feel like I'm responsible for it? And I've come to terms with the attitude of, and I you know, could be wrong, and you might feel differently because just because I say this doesn't mean it's, it's fact for everybody. I don't feel particularly guilty about what's happened in the past because I, I did not have a part in that. However, I guess what I would feel guilty about as a teacher or as a U.S. citizen is to not take the time to learn what happened in the past and learn the truth about the past. And I see that as our responsibility. So it's, it's not I did it, it's I need to learn about it. I need to learn, learn the truth. Another thing that probably today, I'm lucky to be retired because of the way things are without going too deep into it, uh, I've always felt that the best history was to teach it all. And America has tremendous great things to teach. And we have good things to teach. But I'm sorry to say there are some bad things there. And in some cases, there are some ugly things there. And I, I think the only way you can really get a complete picture of history is to put all those pieces together. So don't, don't ignore any of them. Uh, it's all part of the story. It's part of what makes the country what it is. This, I, I don't take great pride in this either, because I consider myself to be a Christian, and many of you folks probably are. I'd like to think that you know, you're good, one, good ones, and I'd like to think that I'm okay, I'll know someday. But um, a lot of this started with what's called the Doctrine of Discovery, which was a papal decree issued by Pope Alexander VI in 1493, right after Discovery's taking place, which applied to the New World. 
It declared that any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited by Christian rulers, and declared that the Catholic faith, which of course now is, uh, back then that was all there was, and then the Protestant Reformation came, so Christian. Uh, by Christian rulers declared that the Catholic faith be exalted and everywhere increased and spread. This doctrine of discovery became the basis of all European claims in America, as well as the foundation for the United States, which we always talk about Western expansion, manifest destiny. And we, uh, it's a mixed bag, and you really have to, I really have to be careful in a sense, because we would not be the great country we are without manifest destiny, but there were groups of people that paid a price for manifest destiny, and no one more than the indigenous population. So, is that kind of like diplomatic enough to say it helped make us great? But there were people that were hurt by that. Uh, over the course of time, then, whether it was uh, in the New World, whether it was the British or the French or the uh, Spanish, even more so the English, even the Dutch. No matter what European colony it was, they would come over and basically plant the flag and claim territories for the European monarchs, which uh, had to really baffle a lot of the indigenous people that had been here for thousands of years. For instance, in Green Bay, when they plant the flag, the flag and claim it for New France, um, I'm sure there was some confusion as to how that, that could happen, especially with the typical indigenous attitude of land ownership versus European concept of land ownership. So whether it was during the period of discovery, colonialization, independence, after we became a country separate from England, or the expansion, that whole policy came out of really the age of discovery from the very beginning going back uh, very early in history. Over that course of that time then, as you, some of this, you no, no doubt know, because so many diseases the indigenous population had no defense against. Uh, smallpox and those kind of things could wipe out entire, entire tribes, entire groups of people. So whether it was disease, or whether it was war, or forced relocation, of which if I'm wrong, I apologize, but I believe the whole chunk were either re, uh, relocated 11 or 12 times and had their own trail of tears, that's the problem. We have a tendency to think the Trail of Tears, we think of the Cherokee, which we should, but just about all, just about all, if not all of the indigenous groups had their Trail of Tears, and, and that often gets missed. So between the Zoe, the Zoe, disease, war, and forced relocation, uh, life on the reservation, oftentimes starvations on, uh, in the reservations or on the reservations, there, the killing of all the buffalo, which was so fundamental to the Plains tribes especially, there was a dramatic decrease of the indigenous population in the United States. In fact, I believe the last I saw, it had still not recovered to the numbers when Columbus first got here, whereas the rest of the population is in the room. This is uh, something I don't even like putting up, put up there, but what, you know, what, what are you gonna do? This got said. Philip Sheridan kind of showed you too, the people will say history never changes. But the perception of history always changes. And it's kind of like when I was growing up, Custer, poor Custer, was wiped out by the Indians. If you study and see that what he was trying to do was wipe out the Indians, then all of a sudden he goes from being a hero to a bad guy. Sheridan, who was a very, very famous Civil War cavalry officer and Union general then, uh, very trusted along with Sherman, if you Look at Sheridan and Sherman and Sherman's March to the Sea up here in the north. In the north, we'll see that as a devastating total war which helped bring the Civil War to an end. If you are a native southerner, Sherman is not a very good name in the south, and neither is Sheridan. And Sheridan once made the crack, and he, to his defense, and I'm not going to defend him very strongly here, he supposedly said that he said it in jest. He said that the only good Indians I ever saw were dead. Now, if you take that, and when we were growing up, I hate to say that I had heard the only good Indians are dead Indians. Now, maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, more power to you. Then how much closer can you get to that evil word genocide than that? 
And so it was, it was there. And with that kind of attitude, and I'm certainly not saying he's the only person that had that type of attitude at all, uh, the Indian population in America, and these things, you know how stats are, it, it, who knows? So I'm only, all I mean by that is that it was estimated at 10 million within North America. I've seen estimates much higher than that. I haven't seen any any lower than that, so that's what I put up there conservatively. But by the time you get to 1890, wounded me, if you remember that massacre, uh, population was down to 228,000 or something like that. You were talking about basically uh, many of the tribes had become, um, and we're not talking about, we're talking about human beings here, extinct, and there were many others that were on the path toward extinction. So there was a change in attitude, but what kind of can get you in trouble is the last thing I want to, any of you to think when you leave here is me basically, basically defending the concept of boarding schools and thinking that boarding schools were a good thing. They were a, certainly a step forward from genocidal attitudes, but it doesn't mean they were, they were was not necessarily good. Uh, change of attitude, I gotta give Hayes credit for being a white president in those days, and that's another factor, I don't like to judge our ancestors, different time, different age, and hindsight's 2020. And so um, things happened in the past that I wish wouldn't have happened, but I don't like to judge people that were involved that much with it because it was then and this is now. It's kind of like Lincoln, you might hear this sometimes, by today's standards, Lincoln was a racist. By today's standards. He was ahead of his time for his day. And so if I look at Lincoln from today, he was a racist. If I look at Lincoln from his times, he was ahead of the game. And I think that context has to be put in there. So Hayes, when he said, many if not most of our Indian wars have their origin in broken promises and acts of injustice on our part. So he was willing to accept some of the responsibility for the things that had happened over all those centuries. There was a lady uh, who wrote A Century of Dishonor, Dishonor Henry Hunt Jackson, which was uh, chronicling the behavior between the U.S. government and indigenous populations that came out at that time. Remember, we're moving into what's called the progressive era at this time. So whether you were talking about labor rights or women's rights, fighting for the right to vote, uh, the anti-saloon leagues, prohibition, minority rights, including Native American rights, that, that all of is kind of that progressive movement forward back during that period of time. At which at one time Wisconsin became a leader with the Wisconsin idea and Robert the Follett, but here I'm going to go in another direction. Sarah Winnemucca uh, loved the fact that she, as a Paiute indigenous person, wrote Life Among the Paiutes and talked about and uh, chronicled their story as a tribe and what they had gone through and so on. And so you have an indigenous author from back at that time. So now we're starting to get into those, those folks that, that come and say, well, I thought this was about the Pony Indian School. And it's like, uh, so far, nothing's been said. But it's, it's uh, I don't know if you can jump right into those things until you see the evolution or progression as to how we got to that. By the time you get to 1879 all the way to 1934, there was a new policy toward indigenous people in the US that was referred to as assimilation. And what they were going to do, what the intention was, uh, was the attitude to uh, make every effort to, sounds weird, Americanize the American Indian. <laughs> and so you're trying to take the people that have been here for thousands of years and make them more American, which is ironic. And I don't make light of it, it's just ironic. Um, part of that was the Allotment Act, the Dawes Act, to show you how, how People can stumble on this, including me as a history teacher when I first started as a rookie. Uh, I, I thought on the surface that wasn't a bad thing because you kept hearing about all the th great things about the Homestead Act and free land and so many of our uh, immigrants came over here with the idea of coming from Europe and you've got 160 acres of land that you could either homestead and or buy pretty cheaply. What it used to be 50 bucks or 40 acres, I think it was back in the day, of course, different day and age. But 
they were going to do the same thing then with what was left of the reservation land. So you take the reservation land and split it up into anywhere from 160 to 320 acre parcels and allow probably adult males, I would have to research that further, to lay claim to that reservation land. What you ended up with were millions and millions of acres that were left over after that was partitioned off. And that land went then to the government for sales to white people. So if you see like the Oklahoma land rush, the Sooners, I mean, they didn't, they didn't get out there like, oh, look at all this available land. That land was made available through things like the Dawes Act by in, anywhere from maneuvering or stealing the land from the indigenous people. But then you're back to, we all live on, uh, pretty much now, at the time of the that white people first came here, Ho-Chunk land. And so I, I live on, we have our eight acres and a cabin on Ho-Chunk land. And so you don't see a whole lot of folks saying, well, it's, it's time to give it all back, which you're not gonna see happen. And at the same time, we should, we should remember the fact that who was, who was here. So, I don't know if I missed something or not. But anyhow, oh yeah. So morality, that's the other thing they wanted to do was because the indigenous people, without lumping them all together because there may be exceptions, were very tribal in nature, and typically Europeans were very individualized, individual ownership of land. The other thing they were trying to do is to, in a sense, attack sovereignty or sovereign nations. So instead of the tribes being seen as separate sovereign nations living within the United States, they were trying to create eventually U.S. citizens that would forget about the tribes and become simply U.S. citizens. So, are we lost? I'd sing a song if I could sing. So, the last I, I saw, that the, and this certainly is different because it was a couple years ago, uh, current First Nations population around 7 million or so, uh, which is less than even that conservative figure back when uh, Europeans first came. And then the U.S. population at the time that we did this was 327.2 million, so you can see really the fraction of the population to a degree that the indigenous people make up. And the land, which was back there, <laughs> which at one time was all indigenous. That is what was left for reservations that's still in ownership theoretically by the, by the tribes. And uh, Wisconsin does have, by the way, some of the most, highest amount of reservation land of any state east of the Mississippi. But that also related to that uh, idea of relocation where the Native American population was pushed across the river. A good example of that down where we live, the Kickapoo. The Kickapoo are now in uh, how to say Kansas, I believe. There's a group in Kansas, uh, in Mexico, and a group in Nebraska. But uh, at the time the white people first got here, they were down in this area along with the Sauk and the Fox, or Meskwaki. Um, so that's the reason we don't have that many reservations, because most of the Native American people were removed. The whole chunk, in fact, have a reservation now in Nebraska. They had been in South Dakota, had been in Minnesota, uh, had been in Nebraska. That's where the reservation is now. Were they displaced from out east, though? Well, that's another story, if I go far enough, is that some of these tribes had been pushed further west by tribes that were pushed earlier on on the eastern seaboard. And so, yeah, there were tribes that were not native to Wisconsin that ended up in Wisconsin. But the whole chunk were original, too. Oneida was so on. Oneida came from New York. They were part of the um, Iroquois Confederation, along with the Tuscarora and um, that group. Now, Richard Henry Pratt, who can come off as a real villain here, if we don't put it into context of his time, made the statement that a great general had said that the only good Indian is a dead one, reassessing again, what, uh, reaffirming what Sheridan had said. And that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres of the Indians, not of white people. In a sense, I agree with this sentiment, but only in this, 
that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead, kill the Indian in him and save the man. And that is exactly how we ended up at boarding school. Modeled after Carlisle, um, this Pratt had overseen the, the capture and imprisonment of a group of Apache prisoners, adult males, who were taken down to Florida, and he practiced this idea of forcing those folks to learn English, to uh, give up the Indian way, to uh, wear white man's clothes and those kind of things. And he felt that that was successful enough with that group of Apache prisoners that it would be a good idea to do that at a national level with children. And this is the really, really sad part. To separate the children from their parents, get them into boarding schools, cut the ties to a degree even with family, so that, uh, fairly dramatic, this last group of Indians who lived the Indian way would pass on and the new individuals that had been trained in a new way would become Americanized. And so uh, I can't think of being a parent, I can't think of anything more emotionally drastic to me than to separate me from my children. And so it's a, that in itself uh, is traumatic and so traumatic that it has affected generations and some of the issues today even yet amongst the indigenous people go back to the trauma that was passed on intergenerationally over these particular issues. Native American children at these boarding schools were separated from family at an early age to begin forced assimilation. That's the key word, forced. I thought about this with um, many of the other immigrants, not the other, immigrants that came, whether they were German or Norwegian or today it's Spanish or uh, Mexican or uh, whoever else, that oftentimes eagerly gave up the old way, learned the language, and moved on, and uh, so became Americanized. But the real difference here is you're talking about people that left their country, came into a new country, and then chose to adapt new ways versus people that were here first that were not immigrants, that were already here, that were being forced to change. So language, tradition, ceremonies were forbidden. That's why so many tribes today are struggling very hard to try to save the language. Because once the language is gone, a lot of your identity is gone. And this gap where so many children were not allowed to speak the language and were discouraged sometimes even by, uh, sometimes by families thinking it was the best for them, then there became this shortage of individuals that carried on the language. And the last I knew, and if this could be wrong, anybody in the crowd that knows better, just say so. But the whole chunk Nation, I think, now has maybe 50, 60 fluent speakers of ho chunk and uh, are doing everything they can to carry on the language. But it's going to have to happen pretty quick because most of those folks are elderly. Uh, in addition, then, their hair was cut, belongings were destroyed, language, tradition, ceremonies were forbidden, their religions were, of course, forbidden. They were all going to be Christianized. Religion was replaced by Christianity. Very militaristic discipline. Typically, if you look at their school days, uh, 20 minutes of this, 15 minutes of this, 20 minutes of this, uh, two or three hours of, of study, and then lunch, dinner, whatever you call it, and then to vocational work, whether it was on the farms or wherever else for the afternoon, and then they would uh, eventually eat, and then they'd have uh, probably religious services at night, and taps at 9 o'clock, and so every day was structured. Academics, vocational training, yet typically morning was vocational training, afternoon then was work. Before and after pictures, and uh, again, I don't make light of this, it just shows the drastic, one minute you're walking in and you are still indigenous and native, and then within a day or two, your look is completely different. Good or bad, well to me that would be bad, but um, that's what was done. Now, this is an interesting thing because watch this with, with interest. It was part of a, a, a program called Into the West, Steven Spielberg. Can I legally use it? 
I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. well. <laughs> Thank you. But um, I had some people that were in the audience last time we had a group, interestingly enough, that felt it was too dramatic and uh, surprised me because that's a, it's Hollywood and TV. <laughs> what do you think it's going to be? Well, Pat and I both felt that this scene, although granted, it may be 100% realistic, it may be, especially at the end, um, exaggerated, which I don't know. Uh, we still felt it was worth, worth watching. So it's a little bit about boarding school and the experience that this young man had. So when, when it's all said and done, I guess for Patsy and I, when we first saw that, it was we saw it as very moving. Uh, we'll say, granted, it's Hollywood, it's TV. Did they over dramatize it? I I have no idea. But there are certain parts, as far as traveling thousands of miles to a place that was new to them, that's true. To um, be having their say clothing and medicine bags and so forth taken away, that part is true as far as being forced to wear then uh, uniform type clothes, that part is true. As far as cutting their hair, that part is absolutely true. Is it fictitious or not that the young man tried to run away? It's probably true. We felt that that brought an impact to us in Winslow. So, uh, one of the things going on, oh, I should also should have said this from the very beginning. We really, when we did this, tried to do it the right way. The very first thing that we did before any presentations, because I think this, I think this, the indigenous people should be in the forefront of this story. And the very first thing we did is ask to meet with the whole Chunk Nation at the tribal headquarters in Black River with people of their choice. We didn't know that, you know, I didn't know that contact. We just said, whoever you think should be there, we want you to see what we're going to present before we present it, because if you think it does good, we want to do it, and if you think that it doesn't, we don't want to do it. And so I do want, to, I do want you to know that we did that before we ever tackled the subject. Now, I have been contacted by a student at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Adrienne Thunder is her name, I have no reason are you Adrian? Yeah, I am. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I didn't know if you would make it. I and, wasn't sure I was going to either. And Adrian, uh, don't let me put words in your mouth because I'm going to turn it over to you anyway here. Oh, no. Is to my knowledge, uh, Adrian Ho Chunk Nation is, is looking to go much further with this subject than I ever intended to. And I am so happy to help in any way I can, but turn the subject over to somebody like Adrian. So do you want to introduce yourself and say a few syllables? Sure, I'll say a few words. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You need a mic? Can everybody hear me if I talk like this? Okay. <laughs> First of all, it's good to meet you, Kevin. <laughs> I want to say thank you to him and also his wife for reaching out. Um, I, I uh, heard about this talk coming up and I saw that he had done one in the past. Yep. And uh, so I got in touch with him on Facebook. And um, just a little bit about myself, my name is Adrian Thunder. I'm currently uh, the language division uh, manager for the Ho-Chunk Nation. And um, I'm also a grad student. Uh, my PhD work is in educational leadership and policy analysis. Uh, which is basically a fancy way of saying uh, I'm, I'm learning about schooling and how schooling systems are put together, basically. And I took on that work, and my interest in that work actually has a lot to do with this. Um, both of my parents had parents who attended boarding schools. Uh, on my mom's side, uh, both her mother and her father attended Genoa, uh, which was in Genoa, Nebraska. Um, so she's a Nebraska Ho Chunk. And then my father, uh, his mother and all of her brothers and sisters attended uh, the Toma Indian School. Um, and then, of course, uh, my dad and his siblings uh, attended the Nielsville Day School. So there's just a whole bunch of that experience in my family. And um, 
for me, it was uh, trying to delve into some understanding about things that I was seeing in my own family, um, behaviors, uh, attitudes, um, you know, various things that were um, harmful, really, to my family. Um, and my sisters, my brother and I growing up, um, you know, there were things that I heard about um, uh, how good young people are and are, we are known for our generosity and our compassion and our willingness to help others. Um, and even with the first visitors that came here to Wisconsin, uh, the French Explorers, uh, we opened our, our doors, our communities, and uh, welcomed them in and helped people uh, kind of get to know the land, essentially, and how to live on it. Um, and, and so, again, for years and years, I kind of heard all of these stories about who we are as Cochon people, and, and proud of that, of course. But then, the day-to-day -day reality, you'd see other things, and you would hear about other things. And of course, interactions with uh, the non-native community uh, were not always positive. Um, there was racism and all of that stuff. And so all of that rolled together, just really wanting to find some answers about why. Why are things the way that they are? And so again, going along with the stories that I heard growing up about this experience that my grandmother had, and then much, much later in life, finding, about, finding out about my mom's parents, and uh, actually going to Genoa, and walking through one of those buildings with her and seeing um, you know, what remained of the history of that place. Um, the, the iron works and the steel works that the young men, they had to make um, you know, farming implements and help out with learning how to, to be good farmers, essentially. And the ladies, the young ladies, I found the records of my grandmother who was in training to become a seamstress. That was the, that was the vocational training that she was receiving. Um, and a lot of times, and I don't mean to like <laughs> jump in here. Talk no, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have you don't have any idea how happy I am. <laughs> I really um, am. So anyway, um, that kind of led, like I said, I mean, so all of that led into my experience of schooling, and even in my own personal experience of going to school, I I enjoyed school so much. I loved school. I loved learning. I, I read books like they were, you know, gonna take them away from me or something. Um, I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And at the same time, um, I got mixed messages from my parents about education. On one hand, they knew that it was a, a really important tool for each of us to have, and they really encouraged our participation in school. But on the other hand, there was this um, underlying sentiment of um, don't, don't get lost along the way. Don't be led astray along the way. Uh, and there was, there was that dichotomy, I guess, of messages uh, of schooling both being a really good, positive thing and at the same time being something that you got to be careful about because you don't know where it's going to take you. Um, so um, for that, you know, I, I appreciate the, the, the parents, my parents and what they went through and what their parents went through and um, that brought me to the point where I am today. And um, when I talked with Kevin, one of the things that I really wanted to make sure that he understood was that I think this is an important story for both sides of our community to tell. I think it's really important that um, all of us uh, kind of take stock of that era, that, that time, and to really think about the lessons that we need to learn from all of that. Um, you know, it was a really, um, I talked with uh, somebody from the Journal Sentinel today and I was telling her, it's, you know, um, to say that it, the acts that were performed in those institutions were heinous is a gross understatement. Because if you think about the damage that, it, that happened not only to these tiny souls, these young, young people, um, but then to think about for how long that went on, um, not only in this institution, but you know, dozens of others like it across the country, if not hundreds of others like it across the country, um, but then generationally what that does, and then what that does as collateral damage moving forward, um, you know, just thinking about all of that, uh, it just really hits you in the heart. You know, it's a really difficult story. And um, it kind of goes back with what I was trying to say previously that if you want to get a total picture of how things are, why things are the way they are, mm -hmm. you can't ignore certain things that happened and think you're going to come to an understanding, either for indigenous people or for non-indigenous people. 
both sides need to understand how things got to where they are in order to fix it in the future, in order to go a better direction in the, in the future. So I better get going, but Adrian, if you feel like I want to sit right up here in the front and then you can just jump right in. And if you hear anything that I have to say that you think is inconsistent with what you know, just say so. No problem. So anyhow, one of the things going on today, in fact, there was just a study that was released yesterday. I, I was really happy it got out there, uh, but I wish it would have been out there a little bit farther ahead. I did skim through, I think it's a 114-page report on uh, the boarding school initiative. Now that we have the Secretary of the Interior is Deb Holland, who is indigenous, go figure. The Indian Affairs were under uh, Interior for years and years and years, and finally we have someone that's indigenous and ahead of the program, but um, there is a, it's just the surface is just, is just beginning. For me, it was to educate to a degree a book club to have a better idea of what was going on in the book they read. Um, but that's just, in the last two years, it, it just exploded. And so you're going to see, if that's the right term, you're going to see a tremendous amount of investigation throughout the entire country and it's going to be very interesting to see what comes out of what institution. I have the suspicion, which could be wrong, uh, but just figuring some were, some were bad and some were worse, depending upon who the superintendent is. And I know as we go later, Toma was often considered to be a model school, but it was a model school to a bad concept in the first place. So, yeah, which is funny. But this is one of the one of the things we're trying to get done. And in fact, in the Toma, uh, what's it, what we call that underground uh, radar uh, ground ground, ground penetrating, penetrating radar. radar. <laughs> yeah, they're they're apparently uh, have been either confirmed or likely burials that have taken place out at the at the um, location of the VA and very likely relate to um, individuals that were lost at the time. So this one's Carlisle, the cemetery in 1935, the cemetery you get today. That in itself is bad enough, but at least the people are somewhat accounted for and there are graves there. Some of these folks are just left home, went, never came back, and there's no sign of anything. And that's one of the things the initiative is going to try to do is account as best they can for these people. Now, this may be wrong for me to do, but uh, Jim Thorpe is one of my heroes. <laughs> and so I don't want to make light of the subject, um, but the thing Jim Thorpe went to Carlisle, and I say it out of respect, he and his teammates turned into one of the greatest football programs in the history of the United States. And so that's not like, whoa, that's a good thing. That just is a credit to Jim Thorpe and, and to his teammates. One who uh, taught, or one who coached at uh, Toma, in fact. So Watho Hook, forgive my pronunciation, who was uh, in Sauk Fox, um, he was voted the most, the most uh, greatest athlete in uh, the first century, the first half of the 20th century. This gentleman, Charles Brown Lowclaw, did go to Carlisle. He's from the Ho-Chunk Nation. He was in Black River, and he was uh, in, was a writer for the newspaper, Black River Falls Banner Journal. Is that still going? Mm -hmm. And so from 1930 to 1949, as I understand it, there was an article every week, or almost every week, Indian news, that he was writing about the uh, his community. And I have not dug out all those articles, but I think it would be a great place to, to look for information. Carlisle School was considered to be a success. Now here's the problem. That depends upon who you ask. If you're Richard Henry Pratt, and if you're with the people thinking that we're trying to teach these children skills and learn the white man way and give up the Native American way, then it was a success. If you're talking to the indigenous people and their attitude about it, which has been somewhat, I wouldn't say silenced, but perhaps ignored, then they, you might have a different feeling. Um, Off-reservation government Indian boarding schools in the United States. There's one you were talking about, Genoa, right? Genoa in Nebraska. 
But there were many, many, many more schools than that. Some of those were established specifically as boarding schools by the U.S. government, but there had been many schools that were established by uh, missions, religious groups, and, and so on. So there were a lot more boarding schools than just that, but those are some of the better known government established from the very beginning, including FOMA. In Wisconsin, I think we have, last I saw in the report today, there were 11 recognized boarding schools in the state of Wisconsin. But uh, my, my subject that I picked in the beginning was Toma. So I did research much into Nielsville, which started in Black River, I think, but then moved to Nielsville. I didn't do that much study on Wittenberg because there was one up there, and there's some on the United Nation, and there's all kinds of uh, up in the Ojibwe reservations. But the concentration for me personally was Toma. Toma Industrial School founded 1893. It actually was commissioned in 1891, but when opened in 1893, this school was one of the off-reservation boarding schools operated by the federal government in Wisconsin. That is a picture of the main building, and the main building still stands. Which uh, I taught all years, all those years of history in cash, and I didn't know. You know, I, I apologize for that. My uh, uncle's career was at the VA hospital. As firemen at the VA hospital. And I've been to the VA hospital or observed by many times, and I had no idea uh, until I started research here that that was the location of the Indians. Uh, why Toma? In this case, again, I'm talking concentrating Toma, uh, serving Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, especially because what I've read. The Ho Chunk Nation does, did not and does not have a reservation in Wisconsin. They were essentially moved several places, including Nebraska. But I like this personally that many of the Ho Chunk kept coming back and refused to stay where they supposedly were supposed to stay. And eventually, the Ho Chunk population, although no doubt now there's more mobility. Many of the folks that originated in this area uh, and carried on the Ho Chunk ways for people that came from the reservation and found places to stay here. Eventually, I think they were able to get 40 acres of land. May or may not have had to buy it, but the reality is almost always the land was such that you, you couldn't live off it. I mean, it was, they were destitute for, for what I know. Um, Access to the railroad, that's the thing. A lot of these folks were brought in by railroad. Here I am right in their way. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not good for a lot of things. And being in people's way is something I'm good at. So, anyhow. Oh, access to the railroad, and then also community support, which interestingly enough in Toma, I, I, on the uh, online auction, I bought two copies of the Centennial History of Toma. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that or not. Maybe you own it. But uh, very interesting to me. And the attitude toward the Ho Chunk people and the people in the area had gone from fear, largely related to the Black Hawk War, uh, and that's one reason why the treaty in 1837 that removed, removed the Ho Chunk was partly out of uh, everybody being afraid of Indians, no matter what tribe they were from, because of the Black Box scare. And so it went from fear to contempt. And there was a person that I was misquoted at the last time I presented this, Reuben Twites, who was a very famous w Wisconsin um, historian, did not found the school. And at the last area that I talked to, I didn't say he founded the school. He came to Toma and interviewed, probably not only in Toma, but in the area, some of the elders amongst the Ho-Chunk Nation. And he was able to talk to a Mrs. O.B. Squires, I don't know who that was. Mr. Goodyear was a big uh, lumberman there, right? And then a Mr. Morum, I don't know offhand who that is. And some of the leaders of the Toma community, and the Toma community, from what I have read, went from a feeling of contempt to a more of a feeling of compassion, largely because of being educated by Toits when he came and talked to him. He did not found the school. He made the possibility of founding the school more, more apt to be in Toma. Uh, land donation was huge. Either the farmer himself or the city or village at that time 
donated 200 acres in order to have the site of the school. Eventually, that grew to something like 350, 380 acres. It was quite an enterprise. So the land was there. The Ho Chunk population was either there or near there in various places, not too far away. And it was close enough to Michigan, close enough to Minnesota, that it served as a central area and had access to the railroads. Also, they competed for it. There were a lot of communities that wanted that place for a lot of reasons. And uh, part was certainly an economic boost. And so Toma would do their hat in the ring in terms of trying to get the school located there. Toma Depot, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, they still have the railroad going through there. I'm not sure which one it is, but maybe it's the same one. I know you can get on Amtrak. Um, first superintendent was Stephen Sanborn, 1891-1895. I guess you could credit him with preliminary arrangements, first buildings constructed, first buildings enrolled. That's the name of the students. All of the original six students at first year were a whole chunk. However, and this is something that uh, I found up here at this museum, and it may also be in Toma at their uh, Historical Society Museum, because I did a lot of work in both places. Well, I did work in both places. There was a scandal that occurred that had to have been pretty ugly. So something happened at that school that was ugly. And I would uh, speculate, but I don't know if I should speculate or not, because I don't have the exact the exact story, but he was basically railroaded out of uh, Toma by the citizens of Toma, and he's lucky he got out. But to show you how things worked is that the government dismissed him from Toma and reassigned him to a boarding school office. Before he finally was thrown out. Second superintendent was H.D. Arkwright. I don't know much about these guys, frankly. But he did, he did kind of, within a, within a thought, right at the ship. But again, some people would argue the ship was not sailing in the right direction in the first place. But he at least recovered, helped it recover from these scandals. Now, this is a guy that if you think of the Toma Indian Boarding School, this is the person that needs to be uh, essentially studied. And his name was Lindley M. Compton. Now, I'm only saying this, I didn't write this. I'm not saying it's, it's correct. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it was her perspective. This is the lady that wrote the book, The Story of Toma. She says, as you can read up there, during the 30 years that Mr. Ellen Compton was superintendent of the school, the institution not only developed into a model of its kind, but it played a valuable part in Toma life as well. The experimental work in farming undertaken for the University of Wisconsin, which is fact, made it a natural center for farm institutes and meetings in the Toma community. Its Indian school band was a feature of Toma, Toma civic celebrations. Its athletic teams were sought after contestant, contestants. Its graduates entered Toma High School and were welcomed. Were they? How do I know? I don't know. I'm just saying that was her perception, at least, as classmates and teammates. And from it, the people of Toma, both red and white, learned to know, understand, and respect each other. Now, the thing that's, that's good about that, that is an influential person who wrote the book, The uh, Story of Toma, but it no doubt, without any kind of negativity, is her perspective from her view. What's not balanced there, and that's why I'm so glad Adrian is involved, if it comes to balance, is you would have to have information from the other side of the, the group I don't want to put us in the side. But the students who were there, which, or the people that went to school there, or even go to school there yet now, with what their experience is in comparison to how she saw it. So is, is she right from her perspective? I would say so. Is that true of everybody who was there? Probably not. You know, I don't know. It's kind of like when you look back at our school years, um, since I taught at Cashton for years, we'll have students that will say, oh, it was great years of my life. And you have students say, well, I wouldn't go back to anything. That place, pardon me, but sucked. <laughs> you know? And so there's a lady by the name of Henrietta Chief who I saw an interview from her, and she thought the Toma School was fantastic because she, she found Christ there. She loved this um, Compton. Um, but I talked to other people. Uh, Tracy Lillijohn have been in contact with some, and she can tell you stories from other people that would not be as gracious. So where is the truth? 
Adrian's going to find out. <laughs> and I can pass the baton. Uh, the following was a pamphlet promoting the school. Now, this was another criticism that came up, which I do understand. But you know, like if you have any questions or any thoughts or comments, I'd rather you ask me while I'm in front of you. Because uh, some people said, how could I use this propaganda within this talk? And I, I didn't use it as propaganda within this talk. It's got a picture of some of the students. It's got a picture of the buildings. It's got a picture of things. And no doubt, it is out there to make the school look good. But how many times have you seen advertisements on TV for UWL? or uh, any more because of open enrollment, uh, whether it's Sparta School District, Thomas School District, Cashew School District, advertising for students. I mean, who's going to put something out and say, look how bad we are? And so I did not show this, or I don't show this now, as a propaganda trying to sell you that the schools were good. I intended to use it to show you pictures and pictures of the buildings and what buildings still remain and pictures of the people, et cetera. So that's my motive that I thought I should get clear to everybody before we went through. Uh, we give our heads and our hearts to our country, one country, one language, one flag, which again, surface, great. If you are a young individual that also is asking you to a degree to give up your identity as a um, tribal person. So it depends upon how you see that. Now it's with 1917, 1918, this is what was handed out to whoever it went to. I wish I could say who typically would receive these. The Akato Sills was a commissioner of Indian Affairs at the time. L. M. Compton, that's a picture of him that we talked about, who became a very, very, very popular person in the city of Toma. He's very active in a lot of things. And he was also a member of the Indian Rights Association nationally. So maybe I'm wrong about this, and I apologize if I am. I'm not convinced that some of these people even with good hearts, thought they were doing the right thing at the time. And there were some people, no doubt, that had more uh, subversive, subversive attitudes. But um, it's kind of like when we saw that clip where that one lady says she was kind of crying almost and say, are we doing the right thing? And the guy says, well, he knows what he's doing. He's doing the right thing. So I don't know. Have you guys ever been in a situation where you uh, thought you were doing the right thing and it was the wrong thing? So I don't know. Adrian's going to solve that issue, too. Uh, boys' dorm room, is that typical? Don't know. Girls' dorm room, that's what's in the, that was it, what's in the uh, program. Dairy herd of seven registered Holsteins. That is fact. They had an outstanding herd of Holsteins there that were um, award winning. Thomas School Field, teachers and other employees. Does anybody here have a uh, we already heard some, uh, Adrian said that she had a family member that went there. Did any of you have people, anybody else had uh, friends or family members that went there and or worked there? Worked there. Okay. And what if you were? That the yellow buildings are the VA are the ones that were the old Indian school buildings. Yeah. The ones that are white. painted yellow or white. Yeah. White. Yeah. And that also in the far corner of the property by the interstate. Farthest uh, northeast is where that cemetery is. Yep. Because there used to be stones there. Oh. And they, they let the grass grow up, but it, that's where they're at, because I used to golf that course for you. Well, and it was back by the so called. It's in that far corner, so if they need to check, that's the place they need to. Every year in the spring, the sand hill cranes do their main dance back there, too. No it's kidding. It's a beautiful spot. I better keep going. What time is it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, that wasn't all Ho Chunk that were there. That was the majority of the students, but there were Ho Chunk, Menominee, Stockbridge, Sioux, Ojibwe, Osage, Ottawa, South Park, Ottawa, New Cherokee, Oneida, Brotherton, but the vast majority were Ho Chunk. More pictures, calisthenics, which was part of the daily routine. Uh, girls' dorm room, guys' dorm room, the entrance to the campus back in the day, domestic science building and hospital. They had an orchard there, apples, plums, cherries. Of course, there was a lot of work. They had a girls' dorm, boys' dorm. There was an a older boys' dorm, an older girls' dorm, a younger girls' dorm, a younger boys' dorm. Uh, playground equipment, I mean, why, why would you not have that at school? Um, basketball team coached by a Carlisle athlete. 
the cadet corps on dress parade, a hundred World War I soldiers came out of that area and fought in the Red Arrow Division. The Ho-Chunk and many groups have a glorious history of, uh, of um, military, including especially uh, Mitchell, um, Mitchell Red Corps, mm -hmm. the Medal of Honor winner from Korea. Uh, continuing, the Dairy Barn, interior Dairy Barn, I guess you can see these all for yourself. This was a factor. I had somebody say at one of our talks, well, you know, it's not so bad. It was really look at all the things that they had and all the situations. But one thing that was definitely missing, in addition to the erasure of the culture, was you don't see any professionals. You don't see anybody trying to be educated for doctors, lawyers, teachers, or anything like that. They were supposed to go into the workforce, and that's as far as anybody expected anybody to go. Uh, other pictures of school, these are just pictures that a lot of those came from this museum. They're either uh, old postcards and or they're photos that uh, are here at the museum and or in Toma. So these were all Indian school buildings. It was quite a quick establishment. population of students? The, the largest I've heard, without me going through the archives that are in uh, Great Lakes uh, Archive Center in Chicago, the highest I heard is around 400, what would have been the max. And there would have been, by this time when we showed the graduates and so on, there had been 2,000 plus students that had attended there by 1917. It would run another 18 years, so I wouldn't be surprised there were four or 5,000 all together that went through there. These are candid photos. Kind of like reminds me of the idea of an, an annual, but um, I'm not trying to say that's what it was. Why did two Thomas School close? Miriam reports, very important, that um, came out in 1928, and the Miriam report kind of accepted the fact that the idea of assimilation had failed, both with the idea of land and converting all of these folks into um, farmers and ranchers and that the schools had, generally speaking, done much more harm than they did do it. So the Marion Report was kind of like the death sentences for some of the schools, although I think there are still boarding schools that exist, but they are not operated like that anymore. Uh, death of Superintendent Compton, I don't think that was a factor in the closing, it would have closed anyway. There was a couple more superintendents, Dickens and Morrison, who was there a couple years. Roosevelt selected 1932. There's an act called the Indian Reorganization Act, which was the Indian New Deal, somewhat compared to the so-called New Deal that we experienced. And the forced assimilation policy would end, and although this has been a struggle ever since, this did not solve things overnight, but there was more of an emphasis on ending assimilation, restoration of tribes, history, traditions, and cultures, but that's been a battle ever since. It's really not, that didn't just end it. Um, Superintendent Frank Christie was the last superintendent. He was there June 16, 1934, June 30, 1935. School closed at 60 people that were enrolled in the school for that year. That's John Collier, the Indian commissioner, who was kind of the author of the so-called Indian New Deal that no doubt did some good and at the same time probably did some bad. The hospital continued to serve as a Ho-Chunk nation until 1943. 43, it still stands there, but I think it's been condemned. So I don't think anything's gonna happen. Most buildings sat empty until 1943. The Air Force operated a radar and radio school until 1945. <coughs> 1945, the property is transferred to the Veterans Administration, and from 1947 on, it's been the home of the uh, Veterans Administration, which I knew about that, but I didn't know that it was an Indian school before that. There was a reunion that was held in 1996. I'm glad they did that. I wish I would have been into the subject at that time because I would have loved to have been there. But at that point, there were still significant numbers of individuals that were still alive that had attended the school. I was thinking about that, that other than, like Adrian saying, my parents' parents or, or whatever, you'd have to be, if it closed in 35, that's 65 plus 22 now is what, 87, if you were the youngest students there at six, uh, the, very, the very youngest people that could have attended there were still alive during their mid-90s. 
So I do, I do not know uh, if there is anybody that still survives that particular school. Uh, there was a stone that was put out there, which unfortunately is, is I think it's unfortunate because it's hard to find. I mean, we went there for the purpose to find it. By the call. And, the, and you're saying more than what I know, it's not in the place it's not in the right place. So. Yeah. And that, that, those kind of things, I would say, is what this report that's being done now, the Board of School Initiative, that's what they need, in my view, to find out and get fixed, get straightened out. Um, forcing anyone to do something is never a good practice, true or false. I don't know, my parents forced me to do a lot of things, but in this case, that wasn't, uh, was not a good thing. The thought behind Indian boarding schools forcing culture on people from a different culture exemplifies that. As they say, hell is paved with good intentions. And I, you know, I, I don't want to say all these people have good intentions, but I think sometimes even people that are trying to do the right thing do the wrong thing. Now what, preservation or demolition? That would be my question. What do you do with these, with these places? And these, all of these buildings, I, I was shocked when we went up there and started walking around the grounds and we couldn't find any information from anybody. We couldn't locate. We finally, the security people gave us the most information because they were thinking we were up to something. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, it would, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I, I'm Adrian, to figure that out. And other people, is what do we do now? Is that something that should be just forgotten? Or is that something that should be um, remembered? Um, I don't know. On October 3, 2021, the Ho-Chunk Nation had a vigil. I put Tracy Littlejohn's name up there. She was at our last uh, talk down at the reserve at uh, Kickapoo. And she uh, was one of the organizers. And again, sure enough, there could have been two dozen organizers, but she's the one I know. So that's why I put her name up there. Anybody else that was involved, my apologies if you were too. Uh, Indian Boarding Initiative. Deb Holland is currently the Secretary of the Interior. I would have taken time at this time to uh, read some things about that, but I, I'm just going to tell you the report has been released. It's a preliminary report. I saw on uh, Ron Kind, I was looking, just looking at the, trying to find the report. And Ron Kind has it on his Facebook or whatever you would say. So if you want to read the preliminary reports of what they have found, uh, you can read it in its entirety. But I tell you, it's only scratching the surface. It's like phase one. It's gonna. It's just the beginning. I will say that in what I read, there was nothing there uh, specifically about Tom. Uh, nothing good. Nothing bad. There just was. It was not singled out, um, unless it was singled out with the idea of existing unmarked graves. I didn't see that, but that will probably be, I would think that's going to be mine, which I hope it does. Yeah. I, said, I was told by Jim Weinzano, is that how you say his name? Mm -hmm. That uh, when we were at Toma Historical Society doing a presentation there, there's the same kind of thing. I told him we'd do a free one there, or do one there, in exchange for what he uh, let us use. And he said that when they dedicated that marker, an eagle flew over the marker at the date of the dedication, which I thought was pretty cool. Sources and thank yous to the following, and then books that, that I read, but like I said, um, this was, what we did was supposed to be, I keep apologizing, uh, a short enrichment for people in a book. And, um, Grew into more than that, and I'm happy that we took it as far as we took it. But I don't, you know, I don't know if I have any role in it from here on in. Unless Adrian twists my <laughs> arm and we do this, do this together. <laughs> and whenever I say yes, Patsy says yes. <laughs> so, yes. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, there's a couple buildings I know for a fact that are under a national or uh, under registered national historic. But yes. so they won't go anywhere. Good. Um, I work out there full time. Oh, good. I've been in all those buildings. Um, awesome. One thing that's kind of disturbing, but it makes me wonder too, the building 25, there are two long rooms yeah. that used to have jail cells. People yeah. say they were jail rooms. I'm not so sure. Yeah. What, what can you tell me about that? I, I can only say I've heard what you've heard yeah. without being able to just say, that's why one reason I don't want to write a book on this stuff, because it's one thing to do a presentation, it's another thing to get it out there in print. 
like with our Civil War book, you better be accurate or you're not here. So I've heard that there were two cells in there, but I have not, I've never been in the building, I've never seen where supposedly it was. It wouldn't really surprise me if there was a place to hold the runaways, and it wouldn't surprise me if uh, there was not one there. But I, I think that's something else that would be investigated. So are some of those buildings pretty good shape? Um, they're not bad. They're considered good. Some are being renovated. Of course, you can't do a whole lot because to renovate them costs a lot of money. Yeah. And um, some of the stonework is falling in because you know, yeah. it's a lot of sand. Um, but they're not bad. I mean, good. Building 18, which was the superintendent's house, I believe, um, at one time you could go in there and it still had the old uh, glass doorknobs. Dormers really above the doors, yeah. I mean, it was beautiful. It was a yeah. uh, preservationist, you know, dream. Awesome, yeah, yeah. Even if it was one day a year, uh, it would be neat if there was some kind of a some kind of a tour. I know they had a walking tour at one time. We got a hold of the paper, and, but it would be it's just from a historical historian standpoint, it is an unbelievable wealth of history, even though it's not necessarily the greatest subject. Somebody else? Yes. We got two questions. When these children were taken from their families, were they taken as sisters and brothers, or were they separated throughout the country? Yeah, were that, that's a great question. I have not seen. I have not seen that they were deliberately separated, but that would not shock me if that happened. Um, I do know. There's some people will ask sometimes, was there a choice, and that there was no choice. This wasn't uh, the first, piece, some of the first individuals in the nation to have mandatory attendance were the indigenous individuals. They, they had to go, and if they didn't go uh, anywhere from our, well, that's some of it, the authorities from the community and or the Indian police and some of the reservations were required to go around these, around these people. And then, a follow up question too when they graduated from this, were they able to reunite with their families? Uh, and you know what I'm, what I'm thinking, and this is where Adrian might jump right in here. What I'm thinking is, depending upon how long you were there, some of these, some of these children were there for eight, ten years. Yeah. Is even if there was, even if there was a reuniting of the family, I don't think I don't know if you could repair the relationship as to what it would have been. We've had people, I've seen people that went to, went out to college, came back four years later, and you don't even hardly know them. No. So, Adrian, you thought about that? Yeah, actually, um, I, just speaking from my own personal experience, um, I grew up hearing stories about my grandmother was one of the long timers. She was there for, uh, I want to say, like 10 years. So, she was there for quite a while. And of course, those are her formative years as well. Sure. So, um, they said that she was able to speak the language when she left. Um, and somehow, when she got back, she was able to reacquire it. Oh. So, I mean, that's, that's good on her part. Um, but, um, you know, there was a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of damage that took place with her. And again, she was somebody who was really well known as a compassionate person, generous person, all that you're supposed to be as a Ho-Chunk lady. She was, she was all of that. But at the same time, you know, you, you, you cross her the wrong way and you would hear some really <laughs> ugly things. You know, it was, it was um, really painful, you know, to be, um, to know that somebody went through something like that and that, um, you know, you're really hard on yourself and you're hard on your people, you know, and that you turn that, yeah, you on yourself, basically. Anyone else? I know we're run over. I have no concept of time. Nope. This retirement's a good thing. What is tomorrow? <laughs> Saturday? <laughs> oh, yeah, we have a Thomas tour tomorrow. Well, yeah. Oh, there's a picture here. Uh, again, the authority sits back there. To my knowledge, that main building still stands. Yeah, that's, that's building uh, 23. Building 23. Right. Sorry, uh, 32. Yeah. It's oh very God. hard to uh, recognize. It is. It's just got a trim. <coughs> yeah, because when we were out there, we were saying, is this building? Isn't it? And then the security people came What's out. really neat is the third floor, floor, which hasn't really been remodeled. got wooden floors and... Yeah, I love it. Can you get in any of those buildings? I mean, you probably have to have clearance somewhere. Yeah, uh, fire fire. Fire. Pardon? Fire department, yeah. No kidding? Yeah, public, get with public affairs. Oh, thanks. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. And then they'll let the... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's a good escort. Yeah. 
<laughs> it gets too high. Well, I'm uh, sorry, Jared, for going over the oh. middle of my name. This is amazing. amazing. Everyone, can we please give Kevin and Patsy a major round of applause?